my name is Cricket Sethkiss, I'm with the Student Environmental Council, and I have a couple of announcements. First, before we get started, um, I think there's a couple people in the Student Environmental Council that I'd like to thank for all their work and their time and effort, and one is the, the council and all, you know, as a whole, I mean, they've done so much work, and the other is um, Doug Drynan, our president, has, has done a tremendous amount of work for everything that we've been working on this week. Another person that's recognized all the work that the Student Environmental Council has been doing is Senator Tom Harkin. He sent a letter to us um, today, and I'd like to read it to you, and he wishes he could be here, but um, instead he sent this letter in, you know, thinking about Earth Day and recognizing Iowa State as doing a lot for Earth Day. It says, Dear members of the Planning Committee, I was glad to hear about the activities planned for Earth Week at Iowa State University to commemorate the 20-year anniversary of the first celebration. I'm sorry I cannot be with you today, but please know I am with you in spirit. As a graduate of Iowa State, I'm happy to see the growing numbers of students who are involved in environmental and public service projects. As a concern about the environment grows, it's, a great, it's great to see groups on campus organized to foster the environmental ethic, not only on campus, but in the greater community. Native Americans named our state the beautiful land, and so it is today from the Missouri to the Mississippi. Yet each year, these rivers carry away many tons of our rich Iowa topsoil. Air and water pollution, energy consumption, and landfills with no more space are concerns of everyone. With these and other problems in mind, we mark the 20th anniversary of the original Earth Day celebration and rededicate Americans to environmentalism from the grassroots up. A recent poll showed that more Americans identify themselves as environmentalists than Democrats or Republicans. That is as it should be. Earth Day and the environmental movement are about the politics of survival, and none of us can afford to be apathetic about that. We have, um, we have our share of problems, but we also have a terrific natural resources, including our outstanding environmentalists like you. And we have farmers whose hearts are in the land, with clean air legislation overwhelmingly approved by the Senate. In many ways, America is on the right track. But we must continue to look beyond our borders, not just think globally, but act locally too. If we are to help find the answers to the world, and if we are to help find answers to the world environmental woes. Congratulations on the successful series of events you have organized in celebrating Earth Week. Keep up the good work and please continue to stay involved. Sincerely, Senator Tom Harkin. And also, um, I, I thought this was a really nice letter. I, actually, I was really surprised when um, his office called and it was thinking about us here at Iowa State. And that kind of made me feel really good that, they're, that um, our legislators are listening to us at the local level and we're pushing for environmental issues and we're really concerned. We want clean air and we want clean water. And we want to make sure that in 20 years from now, that in Earth Day, in 20 years, that we're going to be able to breathe, you know, good clean air and all those things. But anyway, on that note, I'd also like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Um, Alvaro Soto Holguin, who is from Colombia, and he's done a lot of work in the Amazon region. He is an anthropologist, and he's uh, been director of the Forest Service, the, or the director of Forest Service, uh, National Parks in um, South America and Latin America. And he, right now he's in Canada working on international human dimensions of the global environment. So anyway, on that, I'll let him explain <laughs> the rest of it to you, but here's Dr. Soto Hogan. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Kriti, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to participate and collaborate on, on the, this environmental week here at Iowa State University. Uh, actually, I am in the human, International Human Dimensions of Global Change Program, which is sort of like the mirror image of the International Geosphere and Biosphere Program, and all both uh, parts together are, uh, uh, are parts of the Canadian Global Change Program. Uh, the, there is can, uh, Global Change Programs in different uh, countries of the world. There is a U.S. Global Change Program, there is a Committee for Global Change in uh, Mexico. Uh, there is uh, several Global Change Commissions and Committees in Europe, US Air, and uh, other parts of the world. Uh, but uh, 
it strikes to me, and I was telling yesterday, the people that were participants of the uh, meeting on the Canadian Global Change, the yearly uh, meeting of the Canadian Global Change uh, Program yesterday in Toronto, that it seems to me that uh, we are speaking about global change and global programs, and it doesn't look like the participation of the whole globe is represented in those meetings, see? Uh, I think that the, 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 the problem, the, 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 the environmental change problem, is a problem of the 20th century. And uh, the 20th century doesn't really exist, because the 20th century, uh, speaking in terms of what the 20th century is uh, as uh, uh, as a standard of living of uh, industrialized countries is only a portion of the population of planet Earth. Uh, maybe one quarter of the population of planet Earth lives in the 20th century. The rest of the population lives somewhere between the Neolithic and the 19th century stage of development. And uh, uh, those people, which we tend to see as minorities, and that uh, in reality uh, are majorities of the world, are seldom heard uh, and much less represented in those uh, forums, international forums. Uh, and they are also absent from the instance, the high instance, where decisions are uh, made uh, about the areas of the world uh, where they live. What I mean with this is like the so-called minorities, the Indian populations, some of the peasant populations of the world, that are not quite part of the industrial society and part of the 20th century are not heard, neither represented when decisions are being taken about the areas of the world where they live. And those decisions are being taken by, of course, uh, uh, in the decision makers in industrial countries but um, also gover local governments of those countries. So what, uh, I, I don't mean that the, the decisions is only, are only, in this instance, the responsibility or, the, or, 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 the, or an event that is happening in, 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 uh, in the north countries is also the governments of uh, the south countries that are making those decisions but without the democratic participation of those so-called uh, minorities. Uh, one of the complaints of the International Biosphere and Geosphere and Biosphere Program is, is exactly that, is that the program was organized internationally with very little participation of the so-called third world. And uh, so when the human dimensions of global change program was being organized in Canada, but it's the international uh, human dimensions of global change program that has its base in in Canada, the Royal Society of Canada, when it, the program was being organized, uh, it was thought that it was important to ask the third world its opinion on these issues and concerns. 
having to do with the global environmental change. So we organize a meeting, the first of a series of meetings. Uh, this one it was in Latin America. And we invite, under the auspices of the International Institute for Research of Venezuela, we invite 15 uh, scholars, members or director members of the main environmental institutions or uh, universities of Latin America. And we ask them, what's your opinion? How do you see this problem of global environmental change from this fine point? Uh, of Latin America. And uh, we came up with a report which we call a common understanding for a common future. Essentially what is said and it, what it was said in that meeting is that this problem of global environmental change is bound to create tensions between North and South hemispheres, between industrial countries and so-called underdeveloped or third world or whatever name is invoked for those countries, and that uh, those tensions, the only way to solve those points, the tensions, uh, as it was seen from the standpoint of Latin America, was through dialogue, through looking for ways of, uh, of gaining a common understanding. Uh, yesterday also, in the Global Change Meeting, I proposed to organize an international <coughs> meeting with scholars from Canada and the United States and scholars from Latin America. Not a big thing. I, I, I think that it should be something of about 20 people, 10 people from the north and 10 people from the south, and start uh, thinking together, start talking together, because uh, we don't have too much time. Anyway, uh, part of what I intend to do tonight is to tell you about this report of the Latin American workshop and how this Latin American community of scholars see the problem of global environmental change. What is seen as important there? What are the main issues from the Latin American standpoint? But also I think it is important not only to hear the scholars, but to hear at the local communities, the peasant communities, the Indian communities, because they have a lot to say in how to manage environment there, how to manage planet Earth. So the third part of the uh, lecture is going to be, uh, mm, I, I will try to explain uh, a case study in the north part of Colombia. So we are going to see the different uh, environmental situations of South America of, uh, very fast and how the local population were and have been dealing with the management of environment there. And uh, we are going to concentrate specifically in the north part of Colombia, in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is a very nice case story for what I am saying. So 
the first point that I want to make is that, that unless we establish uh, an efficient dialogue, an efficient way of communicating each other, these uh, problems of global environmental change are going to become more and more acute and eventually develop into a conflict. Into a conflict. So it's, I, I believe it's very important to start working on this north side dialogue. Uh, from the Latin, Latin American standpoint, uh, when we ask them, these scholars, about the key issues of uh, environmental uh, change, they say that on the first instance, the problem had to be defined in four main categories. First, there was an acute problem in north-south relations. Here's what I am saying, telling you. Second, they say that the way as social and natural sciences deal with the problem is not appropriate. Third, they say that it is necessary to develop a new economical language, a new economical thought, a new economical approach to the problems having to do with uh, global change. And fourth, they said that the global change problem in Latin America had to be seen in, uh, in uh, three more specific characteristics that were very, 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 uh, very particular to the case of of uh, that area. Uh, in relation with the first point, which is the north-south relations, uh, they particularly said that there is an increasing economic interlocking among the nations of the air, and that means that nations of the air are facing an increasing ecological interdependence. But underdeveloped world must survive in a world in which the resources gap between north and south is widening and in which the industrial world dominates the global economy. In this economy, the developed world has already used and wasted much, perhaps most, of the planning ecological capital. Such, such inequality is the world's main environmental problem. It is necessary then to establish a new arrangement, a new international set of relationships to permit a more equitable interaction among countries and to serve as the foundation for further necessary agreements on measures to correct current global environmental troubles. So this inequality on the use of the natural resources in Earth was seen as the main environmental problem in planet Earth. Then people start speaking about social and natural sciences, and essentially what it was said was that there is a tendency to restrict science only to description and explanation, and not include prescription. And so it is said that scientists should understand and then propose necessary actions. It is necessary uh, to research and carry that research uh, not only through dialogue with governments, but also more broadly through Latin American societies in order to involve people in developing their own response to global environmental change. So it's seen as science in helping to create a response to, to, 
to, to, to educate people so that the people can uh, create a response to the problem of global environmental change. In regard to the common language, it was says, said that the language of neoclassical and Keynesian economics is inadequate to deal with the environmental calamities of present day. A new economic language is needed in which long-term environmental consequences can be assessed. There is a tendency to confront the environmental problems of the world with an optimistic ideology of development or substantive categories such as sustainability that are changed to adjectives in a vain effort to make themselves as operation elements, operational elements in solving the environmental problems of the earth. So it was said that it is necessary to develop new concepts and terminologies to permit the rethinking of development beyond the straitjacket of macroeconomic thoughts with its limited conceptual underpinnings, under, underpinnings and its assumption that complex social technical systems can be managed using such narrow quantitative indicators as gross national product and gross domestic product and so on. Then there was a long discussion on those specific elements that are characteristics of this Latin American environmental crisis. I'm going to read some of them to you. It was said that in the first instance there is a different of a scope of how the North sees environmental problems in the South and how South perceives those environmental problems there. By example, uh, the Amazonia problem in which the North, uh, while, uh, in, by which the North considered as an important regulator of global climate. Meanwhile, in Brazil and other countries, Amazonia is considered as a very important resource base, base for national and regional development. Then the theme of the external debt, the relationship between external debt and the exploitation of natural resources is at the root of the Latin American social and environmental crisis. Poor countries are obliged simultaneously to accept growing poverty while exporting larger quantities of products extracted from the resource endowment. The problem of urban growth was addressed also uh, for Latin America, in which cities are growing for the next uh, 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 few years. They will grow in 750 million people more at the end of next century. And uh, so that implies a terrible burden for uh, Latin America. And that problem has to be addressed urgently and solved. The problem of environmental diversity and uh, it says that today in Latin America thousands of square miles of forest land disappear here in the name of development resulting in an irreparable loss of vegetal, vegetable and animal endowments. And this is a major economic and environmental issue since it's nothing less than a moral, economical, scientific uh, tragedy. The problem of cultural diversity was addressed also. And it was said that the problem, the, 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 the trends toward development also implied many times trends toward um, cultural homogenization and with that the loss of many of the cultural traits that uh, aboriginal cultures have used to survive uh, in, in, 
those particular environments and that are very valuable for humanity as a whole. The problem of the national accounts criteria. Relevant economic and planning institutions in Latin America remain almost totally divorced from environmental preoccupation. It is necessary to integrate ecological considerations into the central political and economical decisions as an urgent first step Renewable and non-renewable natural resources should be included in local national accounts in order to determine the real cost of environmental deterioration and handling and to avoid the ongoing ecolog ecological impover impoverishment. The e ethical and legal problem in connected with this global change issue the effects and consequences of global environmental change are questions to be dealt with in the field of law. Furthermore, public international law is the only weapon that can be used on the world stages to stop the ravaging of the, of planets, uh, of the planet's resources. Consequently, the workshop is proposing the formulation of new international environmental legislation that establishes individual and collective, corporate institution or governmental responsibilities for damage to natural resources. The establishment of criteria for environmental and ecological transgressions and crimes of international character. The integration of environmental laws already existing in different countries is to be encouraged. The adoption of integrated regimens for areas such as the Amazonia and Antarctica. The establishment of an environmental world of uh, court and the creation, creation of a non-governmental international organization equivalent to Amnesty International in the environmental and ecological field. Those are the main points, the main uh, uh, propositions and reflections made by this Latin American workshop. We are going to organize another one in Africa and another one in Asia and put the three things together, and that will sort of be a document on the third world perspective on the problem. I think that that common uh, document will be very valuable for those future meetings between North and South that I, as I said before, consider absolutely necessary and important. All right, that's the first part of the whole thing. Now the other part is what is what the Indian and peasant local populations of the third world have to say? What can we learn from them? And I am saying specifically that what can we learn from them? Because many times we have the attitude of going into those communities to teach them <clears throat> and to tell them what to do. In some way, we civilize so-called people, or people that live in civilized countries, like myself, tend to think that people that are in the other parts of the world, because they are third, they are less, they are like ignorant and not so modern and not so wise. And so we go and teach them. We invent programs for international aid, international aid programs, and we go there and say, look, you know very well how you do things. So we come, we know, we are modern, we have technology, we will teach you. 
And sometimes that kind of thing doesn't work very well. Like the story of the, the story of the of the Green Revolution. See? Those peasants were there in the third world, producing very ineffectively, but very doing very well from the standpoint of environment. And so we came with this new technology and modern ideas and told them and told them mm -mm, the way to do it is with a lot of fertilizers and pesticides and then you will become rich and produce a lot and be modern and civilized. And what we did was to create a real mess there. And what we are trying to do now is to go back and produce like they were producing before. So let me show some slides. And I really ask for your forgiveness because it may look so a little bit disconnected, the whole thing. But uh, I want to show you some slides because I consider it for me to show you how, how, how the, the problem is seen from this Indian and peasant communities in the third world. So I think that maybe we need to put this machine into a color. So I am going to use the case of Colombia because Colombia is a quite representative uh, environmental setting of, of the rest of the of the continent. Because this country has <laughs> <laughs> Colombia has almost every of the environmental settings of the of the continent, I mean of the tropical area of the continent, of the new tropics of the tropics. Uh, you have the Great Plains here, the Amazonian forest here, the highlands, the Pacific uh, coast, which is also tropical forest and the Sierra Nevada and Santa Marta. So what I will I will show you very fast is how the Amazon is, how the, the plains and this coast, and we go to the Sierra Nevada and Santa Marta. Uh oh. <laughs> Nothing happened. Let's see what okay this is the Amazonia. A lot of things have been said about the Amazon. That the Amazon is being destructed. That it's going to, the destruction of the Amazon is going to harm the whole world. That uh, uh, we must stop those crazy Brazilians that want to really, really harm that magnificent forest and the biomas and etc. Now the real thing is that the Amazonian forest covers a huge extent which is what I want, intend to show there. It's a huge forest, almost as big as the continental United States. And even if some harm has been done in the area, still there is a lot of forest in perfect state of conservation. 
there, see? This is Amazonian forest, uh, it's Colombian territory, uh, rivers, waters, still clean air in the area is quite, quite, almost, almost clean, almost clean. Um, the Indians, the strategy of the Indians, of the primitive, so-called primitive settlers of the Amazon, was to settle along the rivers and flow no more than three or four acres square and then rotate. So one household will be apart from the other one in a minimum distance of about one kilometer, see, uh, half a mile, more or less. And that means that this household here will be rotating the flows around the house, and this one will be rotating here. And then they move. So they have been living like that in the Amazon for thousands of years, managing the environment. And perhaps we can learn of them. We need to learn from them on, on this thing. This is a town, one of the many towns in the Amazonian area. What is happening here is that there is no rotation. There is a permanent settlement. And so people start to build houses and things around in the forest, lacking the soil, and erosion very fast begins to show. See? This, this was forest, is not anymore forest, is not anymore forest, and is not going to be anymore forest. No, it's very difficult to replace the forest once the soils are washed. Again, another view of the Amazonian area the rivers, see, very, there, and, and there is population living there, Indian population, but you cannot see or notice any impact. This is, a, again, a, a white settlement of the area in which people tend to look at the houses along, in front of, of the river for water, and they stay there for long periods of time and they start to replace the forest and manage. And in this moment that's not very great, but it's going to be in the future as more and more population goes there. This is the plains, the eastern plains of Colombia, immense territories also with very, very little population. But the contrary to the plains here in Iowa, in the Midwest of the United States, this area do not have topsoil at all, are escalating <coughs> soils. Very difficult to grow anything there. The only good soils are here, uh, where the um, river basins start to form see, this, this area. But this green piece here is because it's the rainy season there and cannot be used for any intensive agricultural purpose. What the native population was doing there, the, the adaptation strategy, was to be uh, migrants, very immigrant, very mobile, see, with cattle. This is the Orinoco River nearby Venezuela, just to show you the, the plains and the topography of the area. And this is the same plains in the summer. See, the soils are, there is no topsoil, see, at all. So that, that grassland is very fragile and disappears, and it's very easy to hurt them and to cause terrible erosion. Now, the strategy, the modern strategy for using that kind of thing, well, is, I would say, something that has to be very much high-tech, 
the, the richness of that area is the solarity, the amount of sunlight, which because it's near the equator line, is almost the same every day of the year, and the water. I mean, it drains a lot, has a lot of water. So perhaps in the future, it will be a magnificent area for uh, intensive and widespread uh, uh, plantations that will be over the, the, the soil. Um, this is the Pacific coast of Colombia. Again, a lot of tropical rainforest, again, a huge biodiversity, very important in terms of uh, biodiversity, different forests than the forests of the Amazon. Soils here are a little better. Uh, it rains much more than in the Amazon. And finally, the region of the Andes, the region of the Sierra Nevada. Now, I want to go very fast on the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, but I want to show you the Sierra because the Sierra is a quite unique case in the world. It's the case of this very high mountain that goes all over from the sea level to 18, 18,000 feet. Is located in, is, uh, uh, in only 30 kilometers. It was the home of one of the big civilizations of the continent. The Aztecs and Olmecs and Mayas were in Central America, and of course the Incas and Peru and all these people were the high cultures of the South. These Tairona people developed a high civilization in the Sierra, but that culture was sort of unknown until the uh, last 10 years, 15 years, more or less. Again, it goes from the, from the sea all the way up to the, to the snows, and it has every ecological niche present in the tropics from the lowlands, the tropical forests of the lowlands, all the way, uh, way up to the paramo type of uh, environment up there in a very short distance. So what is very interesting about this mountain, besides that being a perfect lab for biological and environmental and ecological studies, is that this Tairona culture that was shown in the map, use the Sierra in a way to permit them to maintain a high density of population, much higher than the actual settlers, without doing an evident uh, environmental damage to the Sierra. And this is, this is how the actual settlers use the Sierra, see? This is the, the, the civilized way, the civilized concept of how to use the Sierra. This fellow comes here, he builds a house by his own, and he starts to throw, slash the forest around his house <coughs> and plant, because, uh, because there is this inclination of the terrain here. Erosion comes very fast, and then he starts a new forest and so on till he finds the next neighbor doing the same thing, see, as the neighbor, burning and, 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 and having his house here, see? he already damaged all this and now he's trying to plow and to use another lots of the, of the Sierra and throw in the bush near by the water till 
you arrive to this kind of situation. That's how the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta ended in the south part after being used by this civilized technique of independent settling and trying to uh, uh, use the plots, not giving enough time to regenerate and create a little mess of erosion. So th this is very difficult soils to recuperate, very difficult. So we went into the Sierra and said, well, if we heard from the chronicles that there was a civilization living here with a lot of cities and a lot of people, how come traveling into the Sierra these days, we don't see any of that environmental damage that theoretically you should see when the Sierra is used uh, so intensively? Because this, this, this notion of, of fragility, of fragility of the ecosystem, people say, well, it's the ecosystem that is fragile, so you cannot overuse it because it's... No, it's not that the ecosystem is fragile, it's the way you, how you use the ecosystem. So we went to see how these Tairona people organized themselves, and what, what, what they invented, so to And so seeing the maps, antique maps of the distribution of the population in the Sierra, we found this 15th century map in which the Spaniards said that there were a lot of Indian population there. And uh, particularly, they speak a lot about the Tairon. This is the Caribbean coast, and this is where the native of the mountain of the Sierra Nevada is located. So we start explorations of the Sierra. And this is an example of an interdisciplinary sort of, sort of venture, because we were involving archaeologists, anthropologists, environmentalists, and ecologists, all sorts of scientists there. So we started these explorations of the Sierra Nevada in 1973, plotting archaeological setting, settings and seeing the pattern of use of this Sierra. And we, what we came up with was this map that showed that the Sierra was evidently, as the chronicles, the Spaniards said, heavily used and heavily populated. So we start to make uh, to make uh, calculations and we can